Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Troy Moling, and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. Lots to tell you about on this week's show. Beginning our broadcast, many cow calf producers rely heavily on harvested forages in their year round feeding program. Sampling and testing forages can help in implementing a feeding program that is not only nutrient friendly but also economically friendly. Market Journal's Bill Dodd spoke with Nebraska Extension educator Steve Niemeyer to learn how testing forage can save producers a few bucks in the long run. One goal many cattle producers share is finding a way to reduce feed costs and increase grazing days. This usually requires the implementation of harvested forages as part of their feeding program. By testing forage, producers are able to create a nutritionally optimal and economically advantageous feeding program. Well, we're, we're pushing pretty hard to, over the years to get your hay and sample, feed samples for your beef cattle uh, analyzed for nutrient requirements and stuff. So we're able to uh, help you with uh, ration balancing and make a diet for your cows. So just like protein and alfalfa hay can range from 10 to 25% uh, on a dry matter basis and grass hay will contain between 4 to 18% sometimes. So. It depends on your field and your quality of your forage and stuff can vary. So that can make a big difference on your balancing of your ration and stuff. So, Steve also tells me it's a good idea to know where your forage is coming from and when it was put up. One factor that can impact forage quality is maturity at harvest. As the forage is mature, fiber concentration will increase. And as the fiber is less digestible than other plant parts, fiber digestibility will inevitably decrease as plants mature as well. So that's all part of the knowing what kind of hay you're getting. So a lot of it you don't know when you're, a lot of people buy their hay now. I mean, it's moving a little bit right now, um, especially in the dry areas, you know, they're trying to buy it. Um, you'd want to make sure it's tested if you can. You know, if you don't, before you buy it, be nice, because you don't know, they might just take a, a, you know, example and think that's what it is without being tested. So. When it starts talking $100 a ton, you want to make sure you got the good quality of what you're buying and you know what you're getting and stuff like that. So that's one thing. So when it comes to testing your forage, there are a variety of sampling and testing methods available. So what are some of the best ways to get a sample and how do you ensure that you're getting an accurate analysis of the product in question? Well, there's a way to do it. We have, you know, hay probes. Uh, they do infrared now instead of just taking a bunch of hay out and oven dry it like the old days we did. Uh, some of the labs now, they'll do it through microwave, so it's a grinding process of the hay. So most of our hay is put up in round bales, so we're looking at probably uh, nine bales to sample uh, per sample of quality for quality. Um, we got a hay probe that we can use. Some of the off extension offices with uh, uh, beef educators will have the probes. Uh, then we just put electric uh, drill on the side, portable drill, and we go inside the bale uh, to get a couple samples. You know, I can usually get three or four bales, you know, in this one canister, and you'd like to get a, re a representation of your bales that you can. So it's a little trick to it, you know, some equipment. And then we'd package it and then you'd get tested for some different things. Once you've conducted the testing, it's time to put that information to work. For instance, livestock producers may want to save some high quality hay for any animals in need of elevated nutrient requirements while saving lower quality hay for livestock with lower nutrient requirements or animals that could use a higher level of fiber. What we're looking at basically for the cow, you know, uh, is the moisture content, the energy value, and the protein value are the main three that we're going to be looking for, uh, the TDN and stuff. So once we get our uh, samples, you can get, uh, there's programs where you can balance your rations. And so 
you got to know how much you're feeding. So you really need a scale. You know, you just don't take a little bit here and there, you know, type of deal. So actually you'd want to, if you're feeding them, a lot of the Sandhill ranches, you know, they're just laying out the hay, you know, that's how they feed their cows. But a lot of times, you know, the calves, weaning calves, uh, bull calves, whatever you got, or even cows, you know, you're grinding the hay, making a ration for them. So we haven't got ours tested yet, but our silage is up in the pile. Uh, we got bells coming home. We got the gluten in the pan, you know, on, in, you know, he's feeding the gluten and the distillers are ready and corn. So you got to try to ma match up and see what your best cost is and least cost rations and quality. When in doubt, Steve recommends reaching out to your local extension office if you feel any extra assistance in determining your nutrition needs would be beneficial. The extension office, we don't work with a whole lot of big feedlots and stuff. Most of the feedlots would have their own uh, um, nutritionists that do their programming for them. A lot of the cow-calf producers are a bit smaller sometimes and they don't have the nutritionists helping them as much. So we have a few guys that are pretty good at uh, ration balancing for the cows and stuff and to see what you've got. Uh, big questions are always the lick tubs and stuff like that if we need them and you know that kind of things. There's tr what we're trying to do is help you you know least cost too a little bit to make the uh, ration required and beneficial for the animal for their needs. Sampling is by far the most crucial variable in terms of accuracy in your feed analysis. As the feed value of forages vary, testing forages regularly can help you implement those resources in the most economically advantageous way. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks, Bill. If you'd like more information on sampling and testing forages, check out the Market Journal website for more resources. And we're sticking with the livestock theme for markets this week. I was joined by Oklahoma State University's Daryl Peel to discuss cattle, winter beef demand, this week's cattle on feed report, and exports all in the news this week. But I began our interview by asking Daryl to catch us up on the corn market and how that's affecting the livestock sector. We've watched this corn crop uh, get a little bit smaller in terms of our yield estimates and so on. Combine that with strong export demand. And the bottom line is we put about a dollar on corn prices uh, here in the last couple months. And so, uh, you know, a dollar higher corn prices is, is roughly going to increase feedlot cost to gain about 20%. So that begins to have an impact. Uh, it doesn't mean that feedlots don't want to feed cattle, but it does change kind of what kind of cattle they want to feed and so on. It, it tends to put more emphasis on heavier weight cattle, they'd rather buy the weight and not have to put as much of it on when feed cost in the feed, you know, cost of gain is higher in the feedlot. So producers that are in a position to be looking at a backgrounding or a stocker type program may want to look at, uh, you know, those kind of implications and, and, and uh, any impacts that might have on the type of program they might want to run this, this fall and winter. And speak to us about any feeding alternatives we might want to think about. Is there anything a producer could supplement that corn with? Well, in terms of the basic feed grains, uh, you know, the whole complex has basically gone up. So I'm not sure there's a lot of trade-offs that really become apparent. Uh, wheat has gone up. So, you know, corn price, uh, you know, if it goes up relative to wheat, you can get to a point where wheat comes into the ration. Uh, certainly there may be some cases where there's some feed quality wheat that's around. I don't know that there's a lot of that around, but if there is, it may look more attractive now than it did uh, just a few months ago uh, with cheaper corn. So, uh, but other than that, I, I, I'm not sure we see a lot of changes at this point. Uh, obviously some of the co-product feeds and so on, producers need to evaluate those and see whether they provide some additional opportunity uh, in this kind of a market. Okay, Daryl, for our next topic, if you could give us your thoughts on winter beef demand. You know, it's that time of year when normally we would see a more restaurant oriented or going out to eat type of demand around the holidays, but this isn't a normal year here in 2020. How big of a concern is winter beef demand for you? Well, it has been a concern as we transition into more of a winter type demand. Uh, uh, you know, we do tend to see more emphasis on food service and restaurant type demand, and obviously there's uh, significant restrictions there and potential for even more restrictions uh, in, in, the, in the coming weeks. And so, um, you know, it, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. If you look at some of the wholesale beef cuts, um, things like ribeyes, which are very popular for Christmas and New Year's holidays, a lot of that buying typically gets done in November. And we've actually seen a fairly normal 
normal seasonal pattern. We've seen an increase in ribeye wholesale prices, um, and so and the prices are pretty close to where they were this time last year. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at something like tenderloin, which is almost exclusively a, a restaurant menu item, those prices are significantly weaker than a year ago, down about 25 uh, percent at this point in time compared to a year ago. So. I think there's a likelihood that uh, we're going to continue to see some challenges through the winter um, and, and it may be kind of a, a long winter and, and it may uh, result in some additional kind of impacts in the in the overall demand situation. Now retail grocery demand continues very strong uh, and maybe you know uh, very robust and so we continue with some of the challenges we've had all through this in terms of the uh, the, the supply chains and the uh, the ability to sort of move product from uh, the food service supply chains into the retail grocery supply chains. Okay, we talked about demand here at home. What about beef demand overseas and how that's impacting export markets? Well, the export markets, of course, they took a hit after we had such a disruption in production, uh, but really they've kind of bounced back. Uh, and in general, I think we're doing okay uh, on the export side. Um, most of the markets, the one exception to that has been Mexico, which is a, a significant uh, uh, export as well as an import market. And we're seeing uh, significantly reduced exports there uh, as well as increased imports. Uh, they're in a very serious economic recession in, in that country. But, you know, our other major markets, uh, uh, Japan, South Korea are holding pretty well, and we are exporting more beef to China. China's still a minor market for us at this point, but it has grown and set new records the last uh, several months on a month-to-month -month basis in terms of the amount of beef that we're, that we're sending to China. So, you know, with uh, several more months ahead, uh, with enough time, if this continues, it will grow to be one of our more significant markets. And Daryl, we're airing this interview right about the time the November Cattle on Feed report is released. Give us an idea of what you're going to be looking for with that report and some things the folks at home watching might want to pay attention to as well. Sure, you know, the last several months we've had lots of ripple effects in many of our markets and, and the cattle on feed has been no, no different. We've had, uh, you know, dramatic volatility in both placements and marketings. Most recently, uh, we've had three months of very strong uh, placements, uh, kind of making up uh, in some sense for earlier reductions in placements. And as we go forward, we're expecting uh, this November report to show, um, you know, reduced placements on a year over year basis. We're gonna be above a year ago levels, uh, we anticipate as far as the cattle on feed total, uh, but we're slowly sort of pulling it back to uh, a little more stable kind of an environment as we go forward. And we'll end things today with any marketing or risk management advice that you'd like to leave us with as we move through November and into December. Well, obviously, this has been a very unusual year, lots of volatility uh, above and beyond anything we could have imagined, and it's not over yet. Um, you know, this is still a story without an end. We're very much still uh, caught up in the public health uh, situation. We've got ongoing uh, macroeconomic issues. I think the cattle industry itself is in relatively good shape as far as the internal factors, but lots of external volatility. So uh, that means producers have to, have to really stay on top of these markets, uh, have to be nimble. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, it, it, to the extent that you find opportunities to manage risk, you probably really want to think about that. I don't think the volatility is going to go, go away anytime soon. Appreciate Daryl being on the show. Next up, agriculture's potential uses for unmanned aircraft systems, better known as UAVs or drones, have been discussed extensively in the past 10 years. One of the potential uses that hasn't been fully fleshed out, though, is pesticide applications. Greg Kruger is a weed science and application technology specialist with Nebraska Extension. He notes there is a lot of research, particularly in China, where there's over 55,000 UAVs making pesticide applications. However, there are a number of hurdles to using UAVs for these applications right here at home. Read all about it in the November Nebraska Farmer. Time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Al, Thanksgiving only a few days away, and I'm sure many folks out there are thankful for this wonderful weather. What's the rest of the month look like? Well, Troy, we can't complain. We had a really nice week in terms of temperatures. In fact, we've seen widespread 70s during the heart of the week, and unfortunately, we had to deal with some wind. But at this time of the year, you can't complain with those temperatures. Now, as we go forward in time, things get a little bit more interesting as we do have a system that was projected to come out this weekend and give us good precipitation. That held all the way through the middle of the week. And then the model started to diverge. 
basically weakening that system and keeping it south of us and yet starting to show a secondary system moving into our region as we go into Monday and Tuesday. So there's a lot of uncertainty as we go forward in time, but overall it still looks like there's a precipitation event, at least for the eastern half of the state, and we really don't tap any Arctic air yet. It is pooling up in the eastern portions of Alaska and the Yukon Territory. At some point it will release. Right now, enjoy the weather. As way, at this time of the year, you can't complain when we're not sub-zero. It just makes winter that much shorter when we don't have to deal with these excessively warm temperatures. So let's take a look at the upper air pattern. And what we will notice is we have a general broad trough. Cool air is working into our region. There's really no lifting mechanism. It looks like it's not going to get any good moisture until it pushes to the south of the state. So overall, we're looking at basically nothing in the way of significant moisture in our region for today. Most of it that develops will be south of the state. If there's an outside chance, it'll be in southeastern Nebraska where we'll see the precipitation. We do see some reinforcing cool air across eastern Nebraska as we go into tomorrow. It looks like temperature will remain pretty consistent in the 40s. We're dealing with high pressure that's moving in. Nothing in the way of precipitation. Most of it remains to the south and east of us. That's where the most concentrated moisture will be for this system. But as we go into Monday, we start to see the second trough starting to develop to our west. And that's going to start to increase the flow at the surface. Low pressure develops to the southwest of us. It's going to bring moisture in at the surface. And we should start to see some precipitation breaking out during the morning hours. And this will expand toward the north and east as the day progresses. So that's by the time we get into Tuesday morning, this trough deepens just to the south and east of us, bringing a fairly good set fetch of moisture up into the central corn belt. High pressure remains over the western United States and the southern plains. That moisture looks like it's going to really hit the eastern one-third of the state and points off to the east. The biggest question is how much do we get right now? Half to an inch is most likely in the heavier areas, but we start to see a zonal flow as we go into Wednesday. High pressure stays in control. We're going to warm back up, slightly back up into the 50s as the heavy precipitation moves off to our east. And then for Thanksgiving, we are looking at another trough moving into our region. Looks like it's going to bring the coolest of the air in during the late afternoon hours and push in overnight as high pressure comes into our region. Doesn't look like there's any moisture to work with as the system to our east has robbed that moisture. So basically just a wind funnel passage. We're going to be cooling back down again, back into the 40s, unfortunately. And that will re-intensify as we get into Friday, the coolest of the air will be over the eastern half of the state during the first half of the day, and then the high pressure is going to build back in, and we see a warming trend, rather significant. In fact, if we look at the 8 to 14 day forecast from next Thursday through the following Tuesday, which is Thanksgiving Day through the following Tuesday, above normal temperatures looks to be in the cards, and in terms of precipitation, a drier than normal precipitation pattern. I will, however, note that the GFS model, from some standpoint, is starting to push some energy in at the beginning of December across the southern plains and cutting that off is uh, cut off low and drifts it around. So this may change, but right now it does look like the seventh, second half of the Thanksgiving weekend is going to be dry and much more warmth than what we've seen earlier in the week. So overall, not a bad forecast once we get by the rain early next week. Thanks, Al. Next up, the latest USDA crop progress report shows 95% of Nebraska's winter wheat has emerged with 39% of the crop rated good to excellent. To get a better idea of the crop status across the state and to discuss any potential challenges, we spoke with UNL's resident wheat expert, Stephen Benzinger, earlier this week at Havelock Research Farm in Lincoln. Well, what I would say is the Nebraska wheat crop is looking better than we deserve. Uh, you know, the last report that I saw, I think there was 36% good, 3% excellent, which means roughly 40% of the crop is in good shape. I think the next big category was fair, which would be probably, I think, in the 40%. Not a lot of poor or very poor, which is, that's the one you really worry about. A lot of things can happen if you get some moisture. Uh, wheat is one tough crop. But to have at least 40% good to excellent and probably over 80% fair to excellent is, is still pretty good. Except for that one cold snap a few weeks back when we got some snow, you know, overall fall has actually been fairly pleasant. So how does that set us up for what we could see in the spring with the winter wheat crop? Well, frankly, the cold snap I remember, I think was relatively early. There was a good freeze relatively early in October, and that's wonderful because what that does is it kills some of the pests of wheat. So there's a, a, a small wasp called Hessian fly, which is a nasty pest, and as soon as you freeze, it kills it. And in fact, when the wheat germinates, it's resistant to it, and then if you have the freeze after it germinates, it's even perfect, it's even better. 
So that's really good. After that, it was warm, which allowed us to basically get in on time. A lot of the soybeans got out on time, so it meant that the soybeans came off, the wheat got in, and then it was mild. So you get really very good establishment before the, the winter, and that's really what counts. Any diseases that gave growers trouble last year that you think we could see down the line this year? Well, the main diseases that you worry about in the fall are all virus diseases. They would be wheat uh, soilborne mosaic virus. We have a lot of resistant cultivars, so that shouldn't be an issue. If you had a really late spring or late fall, you could get barley yellow dwarf. I think that freeze helps uh, push back the aphid, so I don't expect a lot of that. And then you can also get uh, a little bit of soilborne mosaic virus, but again, I don't think we're going to have much of that. They'll all be coming in in the spring. You may have seen in the November WASD report how ending stocks are forecast to be down 15% from what they were last year. So when you couple that with where wheat prices are, does that play any part in how growers should be managing the crop? Well, I, I guess I'm not the one to ask a good economics question because I have trouble balancing my checkbook. But I, I think the rule of thumb would be if you're down in your wheat stocks, it means that there's less cushion so that you're not competing against last year's crop as much as you normally are. So to me, I would manage the wheat for where you think the price should be. And so, you know, if you think the price is relatively reasonable, and if you think that you could get a good price for protein, then you might want to watch your fertilizer pretty carefully, make sure you've got that. And we're learning a lot about fertilizer. Sulfur is helping a lot with nitrogen now because we don't have the air pollution that used to give us all the sulfur. So I would manage the crop, you know, on the, on, I would watch the price. I would see which way you think it's going, you know, talk to your consultants, that kind of thing, get the best information you can, and then manage the crop to make it as profitable as you can. Any final recommendations for us? Well, I, what I would say is, you know, to me, this crop looks beautiful. You know, it's, it's tillered out. The way I look at wheat is the, the savings account is the seed. Once it germinates, it uses up the savings account. But as soon as it gets through the surface and it greens up, and you start seeing the green leaves, then it starts putting reserves back into the crown to get through the winter. And once it, uh, if you have a good establishment like this, your winter survivability should be much higher than if you had a very poor establishment. And, and in this case, we've got moisture underneath. It's dry on the surface, but good moisture underneath. So I think we're setting up extremely well. Now we have a lot of season left to go. You know, I mean, we have, could have a really warm January followed by a brutal spring. And if that happens, the wheat will green up, then it gets frozen back. And a lot of the reserves that it's putting in right now will be lost. But that's, you know, let's not worry about it yet. But when, you will know, we'll see how the weather goes. But right now, I'd say the wheat crop, where you have moisture like this, it looks excellent. And of course, you can always check out UNL's CropWatch site for any winter wheat updates throughout the growing season. Finally today, landlords and tenants often face questions regarding land management, and it can be difficult to keep up with current trends. Nebraska Extension's farm and ranch management team is offering a set of workshops to provide up-to-date information and discuss current issues. Market Journal's Maddie McIntosh spoke with Extension educator Alan Van Olick to learn more. We're doing our annual extension landlord tenant uh, workshops. We focus quite a bit on cash leases here in Eastern Nebraska, mostly because more leases are cash leases than any other type. But uh, they'll be held this fall and winter uh, across the state. Uh, the series will be geared towards current and future landlords and tenants. We'll cover current trends in cash flow rates, land values, lease provisions, crop and grazing land considerations and current university crop information. And then I'm also throwing a segment in there on uh, succession planning. And so we're uh, talking about land leasing, budgeting and management for 2021. And uh, we'll be uh, talking about uh, common lease topics like what's, what are the current rents? What are the current land values? Uh, what are equitable lease, equitable lease rental rates? Uh, and how do we manage or adjust farm leases with communication and lease provisions? And uh, also we're gonna be a little bit in there on setting up a flexible lease if you're interested in doing that. So the, uh, the team this year is going to be myself, uh, Austin Durfeld, Glennis McClure, 
and Jim Jansen. Um, Austin's going to be talking about some of the um, management stuff that goes on with the lease and a little bit about negotiation. Uh, Glenn is going to be talking about doing cropland budgets and crop budgeting. And uh, Jim Jansen leads the university research on land value and land cash lease uh, information. And he, he collects that information. So he'll be talking about those with those land value issues and uh, setting up flexible leases. Due to COVID-19, the original workshop schedule is constantly changing. Alan says those interested in attending need to check farm.unl.edu to stay up to date on the latest information. He also says any in-person events will be following COVID-19 guidelines and restrictions. We know that the two meetings we plan for next week are uh, not going to occur. We do also know, however, that the Lancaster one on December 14th will be live uh, via web stream. And uh, you can uh, check for that at that farm.unl.edu website, look for the land management series, and then uh, you'll find a link to that Lancaster meeting that morning at nine o'clock in the morning. All the locations are, are listed in our, in our news release. And uh, there's also a phone numbers there for everybody, all those locations. And so call ahead to make sure that those locations are occurring. Workshops are free. We'd love to have people come. If we're having a meeting, please understand that we'll be, there'll be a restriction on how many people can be there. We're going to have you socially distanced. We're going to expect that people wear a mask. And so just understand that's how this is going to work. Uh, we'd love to have you at one of our meetings, and we'd love to see you even with a mask on. Thanks, Maddie. Now, we do want to emphasize checking farm.unl.edu for updates. We've got the address right there on the screen. Local COVID restrictions are affecting in-person events, including the ones we just heard about. That's going to do it for this week's show. Remember, if you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. And don't forget, you can get the latest updates on the coronavirus outbreak at covid19.unl.edu. Hope to see you right back here next time. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.